All right. Well, Luke 18, 1 through 8. If you want to be turning there now, we will um, stand here in just a moment. But as you're turning there, many of you, like myself, have you've wrestled through the doctrines of grace. You wrestle, you've wrestled through the sovereignty of God. And one of the things that will hit you early in your journey there is if God is sovereign, why pray? You may have heard that posed to you as a sort of devil's advocate. You might have even thought that before in your own heart. But really the opposite is true, is it not? That since God is sovereign, we pray. Otherwise, why would we talk to him about it? We would just go out and do it and tell him at the end of the day what we've done and see if that was enough. So I'm delighted to tell you that God's word teaches both that God is absolutely sovereign over every molecule of dust that dances across a sunbeam. And you have the privilege and the responsibility to be a prayer warrior. Those two things are not at odds with one another. So with that said, let's stand and honor God who has given us his word. And we'll read Luke 18, 1 through 8. And then we will dive in. Now he, that is Jesus, he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling. But afterward, he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Father, would you bless the reading, the hearing, the living of your holy inspired word. Save the lost, sanctify the saved, glorify your name through this message. And it is in the merciful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. It's very uncommon for Jesus to tell us up front the point of his parable. Study his parables and you'll see that that's very rare. But that's exactly what he does in this parable. Let's reread verse 1. Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. And then he launches into this sort of interesting parable. You, you may have read that before and thought, wait a minute, God's like an unrighteous judge? And no, 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 we'll, we'll get to that. But, but he tells us right off the bat, this is what the parable is meant to do. It's meant to encourage you to, per, to persevere, to press on in prayer, to never lose heart. And then in verse 8, he asks a sobering question. He says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? In other words, he knows that many will lose heart. He knows that many will not persevere in prayer. Last week, Adam talked in chapter 17, verse 22 and following, about the coming of the Lord, the second coming of Jesus and here, Jesus dips into that and says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? How is your faith this morning? If Jesus Christ came back right now, how would he find your faith? Is it, is it growing? Is it shrinking? Is it heating up? Is it cooling down? How is your prayer life? There's a direct correlation between persevering in prayer and your faith. And as we're going to see many times, even though by God's calendar, he says, I will answer you quickly. His calendar is different than our calendar. 
And so maybe you're here this morning a little bit disillusioned going, I don't get it. I've prayed and I think this prayer would honor God, would, would spread his kingdom and, and enhance uh, others' lives, but there's been a resounding no, and I, I'm not persevering very well in that. Well, this is meant to help you. One commentator speaking of how this is couched between uh, last week's message on the second coming of Christ and, and prayer, he said, During the time between the ascension of Christ and his second coming, the world will continue to disregard God, uh, much as it did in the days of Noah and Lot. The church will be like this widow, left without her heavenly bridegroom, much maligned and persecuted by the ungodly. During this time of waiting, the church struggles. How will the saints persevere? Jesus shows us how to persevere in faith and in prayer and in faithful prayer this morning. So one of the things that we, this is a little sidebar, but one of the things that we ought to be praying for is the return of Jesus Christ. How, how often do you pray that? You know, in the Bible, you'll just sometimes see the word Maranatha. And that means come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's a prayer. In Revelation 22, 20, nearly the last verse of our Bible, Jesus says, yes, I am coming quickly. And John responds, amen, come quickly, Lord Jesus. This is a hallmark of the Christian to pray for and long for the return of her bridegroom, Jesus Christ. How is that in your life? Is that something that's on your radar? Are you persevering? Are you growing weary? Hebrews 9.28, Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for those who eagerly await him. Are you eagerly awaiting Jesus? 2 Timothy 4, 8. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who love his appearing. So this is one of the things that we ought to be praying for. Come quickly, Lord, as well as, Lord, let me be ready when you do come. So do a little inventory how are you doing in that department of prayer? But that's not all we're to pray about. From Genesis 1, 1 all the way through to Revelation 22, 21, you see the saints of God coming before the throne of God with things short and tall, big and small, of all shapes and sizes and colors, pouring their requests out before the Lord. And again, this particular prayer brand is what we would call supplication, making your requests known to God. There are other forms of prayer. We know that. Times when you come before the Lord and you don't ask him a single thing, you just say, Lord, I just want to come and, and brag on you and draw near to you and love on you and worship you and boast and honor and glorify your name. There's times we come and confess our sins. There's times we come just with that thankful heart, like the one leper who was cleansed who returned to Jesus and said, I want to go home and see my family, but I can't bypass you but then there are times when we're coming to lay our requests before the Lord, and that's particularly the kind of prayer that we're talking about this morning. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. I love the word there, without ceasing. It literally means like an army who's attacking the enemy with wave after wave after wave of battle. And it's not a 24-7 because they would run out of resources, but it's strategic. You hit the enemy, then you back up, you restock, you reload, you hit the enemy, you back up, you get some rest, you restock, you reload, you come back, hit the enemy. So, but it's a constant strategic type of prayer. We are to inhale scripture by reading and then exhale scripture by praying. 
and it's to go on at all times in our lives. One more piece to set the table for what prayer is, and then we'll dive into the text. Prayer is God's appointed means of communing and fellowshipping with his children. Let that sink in for a moment. Todd rightly said, prayer is talking to the Lord, our God. Let's not make it so complicated. Prayer is talking to our God. But it's also God's appointed means of revealing and accomplishing his will. And ultimately keeping us humble and dependent upon him and glorifying himself as our fount of every need and blessing. I've said this long ago, ultimately and eternally, I can't do anything about anything, but God can do everything about everything, therefore I pray. I get the help and the fellowship that I need. God gets the glory he deserves. It's a win-win. God has designed it this way. Now, through our text, there's two main characters. You saw that. There's the unrighteous judge and there's the helpless widow. I think that's the key to unlocking this parable. I've broken it down like this. To persevere in prayer, we must remind ourselves of two things. Number one, who God is. And number two, whose we are. So let's let that be our outline. Who God is and whose we are. So number one, who God is. And what I mean by that is God's character, God's ways. Oftentimes when you read the Bible, you have to really pay attention because sometimes it's not just giving you a direct one-to-one -one correlation between a, a person, a character in the Bible and God. But compare and contrast. In other words, God is the opposite of this judge. God is not like the unrighteous, selfish judge. That's the point. Through compare, contrast, from arguing from the lesser to the greater, Jesus is saying, this unrighteous judge who did not care for God or for man, he was moved to have mercy on this woman. How much more will your God who is to be feared and who does care for his own, how much more should we have strong confidence to approach his throne with our requests? So there's three things I want you to notice about the character of God here. Number one, he blesses his creation every day. He is a gracious God a good God, a merciful God. We've studied through the attributes of God. That is such an important study. If you weren't here with us during the past Sunday school time, we could still get you a book on the attributes of God. That is crucial that you know who the God of Scripture is. And when you start to uncover these passages that reveal his character, you see that he is good he is gracious. He is merciful. Even in his common grace, he extends blessings to unbelievers who will never stop and say thank you. He does that every day. That's who he is. But he especially takes care of his children, immeasurably so. We cannot calculate how good and gracious and merciful he is to us. And if you ever doubt God's care for you, you know, you're in one of those slumps where you've been praying and nothing's been happening. So you've quit praying and you've just said, I don't know what's going on. But if you ever get like that, listen, take your eyes off of yourself. Take your eyes off of your circumstances, even of your prayer list and the things you haven't been able to check off yet. And look back to the cross of Jesus Christ. Look back to the empty tomb. God is a good, gracious, merciful God. Do not forget it. Number two, God's delays, listen to me, God's delays, and I did say that, the text says that, from the human perspective, there are some delays. Now, God's timing is perfect, but there are delays from our perspective. But his delays, brothers and sisters, are never due to a lack of love for his children or a lack of power to execute it exactly when he wants to execute it. Never, never, never. In fact, Andrew Murray said, even God's timing is loving and perfect. 
Have you ever had the, the time to reflect back over a prayer that did finally get answered in the affirmative, and it wasn't when you thought he should have answered it, and at first maybe you were a little upset, maybe you were discouraged, but then later on as you matured in Christ, you looked back and you said, ha, I'm so thankful that God answered that when he did, not just that he did. That's a sign of Christian maturity. Listen, God is not... Uh, has no lack of power, has no lack of love for his people. Because he is omniscient, God knows your request, even if you don't know how to form them into a prayer. Have you ever been like that? You just come before the Lord weary and tired, and you just sigh. <sighs> the Lord hears that perfectly. He does. Because he's omniscient, he knows. Listen, because he's omnipresent, he can deal with your needs and my needs in Rome, Georgia, and the saints of God in Rome, Italy, all at the same time. Because he's omnipotent, he has plenty of power to go around. Meeting your needs and my needs will not drain his power supply. And the third thing I want you to remember about who God is, is God's timing is not like your time. We're going to go into that a little bit more in a moment, but let me just read probably the, the most famous passage on that. That's 2 Peter 3, 8, and it says this, But do not let this one fact escape you, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about keeping his promise, as some count slowness. So we have to remember that. That is a key that God wants us to hold on to. Now, that's, that's who God is. Now, let's look at the second point, whose we are. Remember, I told you there's two main characters here, the unrighteous judge, and we see that that's a compare and contrast to who God is. God is the opposite of that person. But then there's the widow. And Jesus referring to his people who come to him and who are helpless. And by the way, a widow in Jesus' day was helpless, had no leverage. This unrighteous judge was used to being bribed. So if he was sitting behind his desk and a wealthy person came in with many means and resources and said, hey, I've got a problem, he would give that person his undivided attention because they're going to give him a little something on the side, and he's going to, it's going to help him. It's going to scratch his back, so he'll scratch your back. But this widow, she had nothing, and he knew that. So he says, get, get out of my face. You got nothing. Don't waste my time. And Jesus, referring to us in a, in a way as that widow who's helpless, but he calls us, look at verse 7, his elect. Did you see that? Let, let me read it to you again. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? That's a weird phrase in the, a question in the English. In the Greek, it can mean, and won't he be patient with you? So, Jesus describing his people, and this is why I said point number two, whose we are. Describing who a Christian is, who a follower of Jesus is. He calls us his elect. This word means picked out, selected, chosen. And we know that it's often fuel for fights and division. But it shouldn't be. In this context of our dear Lord Jesus Christ teaching, it was meant to be a term of encouragement. In other words, he's saying this. He's saying, I'm not ignoring you. I chose you. I picked you and purchased you. You are my beloved. Oh, yes, I have common grace for the world, but I have a specific, special grace for my elect. So no, I'm not ignoring you. You think I am because I didn't answer your prayer exactly as you wanted me to or when you wanted me to. But let this not escape your attention. I first came to you. You love me because I first loved you. 
And this ought to unify the church. This ought to humble the pride of man. This ought to exalt the free grace of God. There's many passages I could go to, but let me just read a couple to you. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we, might, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed upon us in the Beloved. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 and following. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jew a stumbling block, to the Gentile foolishness, but to those who are the called. Both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So, yes, in a sense, you are like the widow in this story. I am. In fact, those who have come to the point in their life where they see they have no resources with which to barter with God, they are truly desperate. They have come to the end of their rope. They know I need a deliverer, but I can't buy my way out of this one. I need a savior. I need a defense attorney who will represent me with compassion. But I have no way to secure that with my resources. That's the elect. That's the elect. Only the elect will come to the end of themselves and raise the white flag and say, I surrender. And when we surrender, we find that in Christ we have a defense attorney who goes to bat for us and says, he's one of mine, picked and purchased. She's trusting in me. It is well with our souls, not because of what we bring to the table, but because of what Christ brought to the cross. And remember, this is meant to encourage, not divide. God is not ignoring you, brother. Sister, you've been pouring out your heart for weeks, months, years, and it just doesn't seem like God's listening or even that he has an answering machine. He first chose you. He loves you. Even his timing is perfect. Hang in there. Now, we could go, and I want to go just briefly, but th there's so many times in the Bible where we see this idea that God's timing is not like ours. L listen for just a moment. God told Noah that there would be a flood and to start building the ark. About 120 years went by before a drop of rain fell to the ground. He promised Abraham a son of promise, but it was many, many years before Abraham and Sarah held Isaac in their arms. He promised Joseph, while he was still a youth, that his brothers would bow and he would be the leader. But Joseph spent his 20s and maybe even beyond a little bit uh, in a prison. He promised to deliver his people from bondage in Egypt, but 400 years went by before he raised up Moses. He promised to send his Messiah, but his people had to wait 400 years after the last prophet before, as Galatians 4.4 says, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. So when the Bible says, and let's go back to this passage, okay, Luke 18, when the Bible says that he will do it quickly, that he will not delay long, we need to remember that quickly by God's standard, not delaying long by God's standard, sometimes, many times is very different than our standard. 
And that's why he's giving us this parable. So who God is, whose we are, and then lastly, what are we commanded to do? I believe that God answers every prayer that we pray. He either says yes, he says no, or he says wait. And sometimes when he's saying wait, we get impatient and go, oh, God must have said no. So I quit. I quit praying for that. Now, I admit that it's a bit tricky to determine whether he's saying wait or saying no. But I believe if you're walking clean and closely with Jesus Christ, he will let you know. He will give you peace that passes all understanding when it's time to just say, okay, Lord, you've given me peace to stop praying about that. And I'm going to just lay that over to the side and move on because there's a lot of other things I need to be praying about. But I would say this, unless God has said no clearly in a way that you have peace that passes all understanding, then I would say interpret that as a wait and keep on pounding on the door, keep on coming before the Lord and trust that his ways are higher, his timing is different. There's a funny sidebar in this. Look at uh, Look at verse 5. This, this woman kept coming before this judge. I mean, at first he had sized her up, said, there's no way she can benefit me. She can't scratch my back, so I'm not going to scratch her back. Get her out of my office. He, he thought he had this thing taken care of. But she kept coming, kept coming, kept coming. And literally, verse 5 says, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. In the Greek, that means she will black my eye. This woman was not going to relent. And so he said, okay, okay, okay. Now listen, here's how we have to put these truths together. You are not nagging God, child of God, elect, picked, purchased, chosen. You're not nagging God. He loves to hear from you. He loves for you to crawl up in his lap, so to speak, and say, Abba, Father, good morning. I've got some things on my heart i got to talk to you about again. He's not going, oh, brother, he's going to wear me out. You're not a nuisance or a bother to God. But that doesn't mean that you are to pray one time and say, I prayed, God heard it, moving on. That's not the flavor of what this parable really suggests. Or even worse, well, God knows my heart. I don't even have to pray. True, God knows your heart. And true, God could answer your prayer the first time, and sometimes he does. But over and over in the Bible, God teaches us to pound on the door until the door opens, to persevere in prayer, and to not lose heart. Why? God could answer the first time why this persevering, this pounding, this enduring. Because in the wisdom of God, prayer is not just you come, you ask, he spits out the answer like the bat computer. Some of y'all are old enough to know, what, remember the bat computer where Batman and Robin would just plug in some questions and hit enter and boom, here comes the answer. They move on. That's not how this works. Um, it's about a relationship with your heavenly father who loves to spend time with you. It's about testing your faith and strengthening your faith. And frankly, sometimes over, the court, sometimes over the course of providence, changing you, not just changing people through your prayers. Have you ever persevered in prayer and then you look back and thought, wow, when I first started praying, this is kind of how I was praying. And I didn't even realize it, but it was shallow and man-centered and it was all about me, me, me. And then a year later, two years, ten years later... Boy, my prayer for the same thing is so much different. It's God-centered. It's humble. It's saturated with the glory of God. This is the wisdom of God. Frankly, the maturing Christian who's growing in his or her love for Jesus, who's growing in his or her understanding of Jesus, is frankly grateful that God doesn't always answer our prayers according to our will and our timing, but according to his. 
There's joy in the journey, to quote Michael Card. God is changing you, brother, sister. He's not just changing people through your prayers. I won't elaborate because I've, I've probably beat this horse to death, but I'll just say God changed me so much in the 26 years that I prayed for my mother and father's salvation. He could have saved them the first time I prayed. But I'm thankful that he did save them, number one. That's grace. That's mercy. But I'm thankful for how he matured and grew my faith through that journey. Andrew Murray says, Sometimes God is waiting like a patient farmer until the fruits of godliness, faith, and humility in our hearts are ripe before he grants the answer to prayer. So keep on praying. Don't lose heart. God will bring about justice for his elect speedily, quickly, according to his timetable, without much delay, according to his calendar. Now, we've talked about this idea of election. What my idea is not my hobby horse. It's right here in the Bible. And maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, how, how can I know if I'm among the elect, the picked, the purchased? That's, that sounds good. I want, I want in on that. Listen, you need to know the promise of hearing, of God hearing and answering prayer is not a general promise from God to the world. It's for God's elect, his picked and purchased. So how do you know if you are his elect? How can you know? I said it before briefly, but this picture of the widow, I think, is a key for us. Everyone who comes to the end of themselves, who sees themselves as this helpless widow, and who calls out to God for mercy believing and trusting that Jesus Christ lived, died, and was raised for you. Which leads you to turn from a life of sin and self and turn to follow this merciful Savior. Those are God's elect. In fact, the reason we reach out to Christ and say, have mercy, is because He has first reached out to us. The reason we love him and follow him is because he first loved us and first chose us. So I want us to take a moment and bow for prayer. I'm going to do a couple of different things here. It's a little bit different. So would you just follow along and in your heart have some time with God? If you're here this morning and you either came in knowing, hey, I'm not a Christian, I know it. I know it, I'm not pretending. If that's you, or maybe you came in thinking, yeah, I'm a Christian, I've, I've walked that aisle, I've checked that box, I've been to VBS, I've, I'm here, aren't I? But the Lord has done something in your heart today, and he's shown you that you're like this widow. You got nothing. You got nothing to impress God with. Oh, you need a defense attorney, okay. You, you understand that. You're guilty. You, you're not looking forward to standing before the holy judge of the universe, but you've got nothing to hire a defense attorney. But right now, the Lord has shown you, Jesus, his services are free. His services are free. He wants you to surrender. He wants you to come to the end of yourself and say, the only thing I bring to the table is my sin. But Jesus, you brought, you brought it all to the cross. And right now, I... I'm crying out to you. Jesus, save me. Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, I want to be one of those who are picked and purchased 
Here I am. Here I am. And for those of you who, by the grace of God, for the glory of God, you are convinced of your salvation. You know that you love him because he first loved you, and you know that he has done a work in your life to save you and change you. But I'd ask you, what is God calling you to persevere in prayer about right now? Just take a moment and reflect. Maybe there's something that the Holy Spirit is bringing to your mind and you think, oh, I haven't prayed about that in a long time. I just, I grew weary. I lost heart. I quit. But the Lord in his tender mercies reminding you of this. He's bringing it to your attention. Lord, based on who you are, your wisdom, your power, your love, Lord, based upon whose we are, your elect, your picked and purchased, would you give us the grace that we need to persevere in prayer and to not lose heart? If there's something in our life that we are torn, are you saying, wait and thus continue to pray? Or are you saying no and you're releasing me from this and I can move on and leave it in your sovereign good hands? Lord, give me clarity. Would you do that for each person here? And church, I would say if, if he has not said no to you clearly, then by his grace and for his glory, resolve right now that I will pound on the door of heaven. I will persevere by the grace of God. No matter how long it takes and no matter what the answer ends up being, I'm going to glorify God for it. And I, I'm not a nag to my heavenly father. I'm not a nuisance. But that doesn't mean I should be passive either. And Father, I pray for Providence Baptist Church that you would raise everyone. If on a scale of 1 to 10, we're a 2 in our, in our fervent, persevering prayer, I pray you'd move the 2s to a 4. If we're a 4, you'd move the 4s to a 6. If we're a 6, you'd move us to an 8. If we're an 8, you'd move us to a 9. There's no perfect prayer warrior here. We know that. But we ask that you would move the needle in our lives by this message, by your spirit, and raise this church to a level that it's never known before, corporately, not just individually, that we might pray like this widow prayed, that we might persevere like she persevered. And I look forward to what you're going to do in and through this church and in this community and in Nigeria and in other parts of the world that may not even be on our radar yet. I look forward to hearing and seeing what you're doing in and through us for your glory and for our good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.